Well, my name is Matthew Wells, and I'm the research director here at the Ellen Eye Center. And uh, on behalf of the staff, I want to welcome everybody to the second lecture in our Florida Scholar Speaker Series. Uh, we developed this lecture to uh, highlight academic research from our state in areas that were of scholarly and personal interest to Mr. Elling I. Those areas include the languages, literatures, and cultures of East Asia, such as China, Japan, and Korea, as well as the diverse cultures of Central Asia and the Indian subcontinent. His passion for the vast history of this region is reflected in the extensive holdings at the center's library. The 72 acres on which this library stands reflects Elling's deep interest in the horticulture, ecology, and environment of Little Sarasota Bay and Florida more generally. While Elling's fascination with the cultures of indigenous people of the American Southeast can be seen in his endowment of a position in the University of Florida's Department of Anthropology dedicated to the study of the languages of Florida's native people. And our lecture series will reflect all of these subject areas uh, as we go through the year. Today, we are very pleased to welcome Dr. Andrew Tiddick, the E. Leslie Peter Professor of East Asian Humanities and History at Eckerd College, which is right up the road here in St. Petersburg, for those who do not know. Dr. Chittick received his PhD in the history of early China from the University of Michigan in 1997, and he came to Eckerd College in 1998. Uh, his research focuses on the culture of early South China and maritime trade relations with Southeast Asia, he runs the Asia and Environment Initiative, uh, which engages students in summer field work on contemporary environmental issues in Japan, China, and Indonesia. He is the author of two books. Uh, the first is Patronage and Community in Medieval China, the Xianyang, uh, uh, Xianyang Garrison, 400 to 600 CE, and uh, his most recent volume uh, with Oxford University Press, uh, The Jiankong Empire in Chinese and World History. Uh, as well as numerous articles that have challenged and broadened our understanding of what we now call uh, Southern China during the period between the Han and Tang empires. Uh, Professor Chittick has also received major fellowships for his, uh, for his research from, national, uh, from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Princeton Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, and I might add too, he was also instrumental in getting me to apply for this job. So I am here in large part because of you. Uh, Dr. Chittick's lecture today uh, is entitled uh, Opposing Unity, A New History of South China in the First Millennium. Uh, this talk will explore the alternative imperial tradition of Southern China in the Yangtze Delta in the First Millennium CE, describing its roots in Wu regional culture, links to, maritime, to the Maritime South and Southeast Asia, opposition to unification with the Northern empires, as well as its broader significance on the political and economic transformation known as the Tang Song transition at the turn of the second millennium. So if you could please uh, help me give a warm welcome to uh, Professor Chittick. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Carol. And thanks to the IVA Center for having me back. It's lovely to be back here again. Um, I'll just say that Matt gave his job here almost entirely on his own merits. All I had to do was just point them out a little bit. <laughs> um, so uh, my talk today is about how historians can think about big ideas like China and Chinese, right? So I'm starting very large and then sort of showing how we, about narrowing down to a particular question in the first millennium CE, helps us understand a larger issue. China gets used to refer to a long series of large East Asian empires that stretch back for several thousand years. And the term Chinese refers to the cultural and ethnic identity of the people that, that live in those empires. But these days, China specialists like myself, or many of them anyway, are increasingly skeptical that it's actually good to think this way, that is to just think about China as a unit and use that term um, for the last several thousand years. The problem is that, um, the problem is that we don't have any other words <laughs> to call um, that chunk of territory. I teach a class now and I try to call it mainland East Asia or some other term, but it's clumsy to find other words for this. Um, so it's not surprising. So, so they wouldn't have just calling everything China. And it's not surprising that if you don't work in Chinese history, it's hard to figure out what makes one big East Asian empire different from another one or what you might call them or what kinds of people live in them. You just refer to all of them as Chinese. Um, so um, the problem here um, is very much mix mixed up with the power of nationalism and nationalist history. So what I mean by that is a, a history which seeks to understand the historical origins of a modern nation state um, and an ethnic group, and to some extent in order to justify or extend the power 
of the president. So when we study history this way, we study it teleologically, that is, we study the past in order to tell the story of how the present came to be, right? So if you think about American history, we're talking about the history of how the United States became the United States, and the same with the history of China. Um, and we, when we do that, we mostly ignore stuff that doesn't fit the story, right? If it doesn't seem to lead to modern China, then we don't talk about it. So in a sense, I think of Chinese as meaning something which we think of as antecedent to the modern nation, right? But that's actually not very helpful when you're trying to study earlier periods of Chinese history. It's certainly not the period that I'm studying. Um, so the scholarly field of Chinese history then has all these problems, but it has them more intensively than most schools of history. Why? Because it's the nation state idea is wrapped up with the idea of Chinese civilization, which dominates all the narratives that both the Chinese and Western historians use to describe the East Asian past. So what do we mean by Chinese civilization? Well, so the Chinese civilization paradigm is in many ways analogous to the Western civilization paradigm, right? So Western civilization sort of starts with Mesopotamia, but it really begins to cohere with the Greeks and the Romans, and then it continues forward to the history of Europe and its expansion. And if you grew up taking Western Civ or even most world Civ classes more than about 20 or 30 years ago, then you're really familiar with this particular way of thinking about the history of the world. <laughs> so in the same way, the Chinese civilization model sees its origins in the Bronze Age cultures of the Shang and Western Zhou down to say the early first millennium BC, and then leading eventually to the unified Qin Han Empire, um, uh, from 221 BC through the Qin Han interregnum to 220 um, CE, which sort of serves like the Roman Empire as a founding political unit in Western civilization. But the key difference is that unlike in Western civilization, Chinese civilization is understood as having been unified as a single political unit, a single culture, and a single people from that time all the way to the present. Um, so this greatly strengthens any nationalist narrative of the modern state, right? So um, uh, a central assertion of Chinese nationalist history is that China and its people have 5,000 years of civilization, some of you may have heard this term before. Um, that's the longest continuous history of any national people, much more grandiose claim than other national histories are able to make. Um, one important idea in this model of history is this concept of unified empires and their continuity. So over the past 2,000 years, there's been a series of large ones like this, um, this is sort of the, the main, the, the highlights of that series. Um, Chinese nationalist history privileges these large empires because they bear the closest resemblance to the extent of the modern nation. So in English language history, all of these empires are often just called China, right? There's plenty of Latin nationalist history, which we'll talk about the Tang Dynasty or the Tang Empire, but really they just call it China, right? What they're really doing is saying the Tang Empire is part of Chinese nationalist history. It's a predecessor to the modern nation of China. Um, so those unified empires are also understood to exemplify the most important paradigms of Chinese nationalist history. There's a lot that I might suggest, but for the purposes of this talk, I'll just note, first of all, the idea of unification of a large piece of territory, which I'll get to in a second. Second, the idea of a centralized bureaucratic state that rules all of that territory sharply define the frontiers between that piece of territory and, in particular, the pastoral nomadic peoples of the steppe. Um, the great empires are also somewhat more triumphant and glorious um, than smaller, more regional empires, and they're also somewhat easier to study since they have only one primary, primary political regime, their historical narratives are pretty straightforward, their cultural production is conveniently centralized in the capital. Um, so let's just take a look at these large empires with the grief before I get into the core of my talk. Um, if we just take a look at the map of the Han Empire, this is you know, 2,000 years ago, and compare it to a population map of modern China, um, you know, it's quite obvious that the, the Han Empire itself more or less maps onto the area where almost all the people of China live, right? So it already has pulled together a core that has been populous from, for the last 2,000 years. Um, and if we jump forward to the other empires, we can see that that core region, um, uh, which when you think about that, that core region, which in the Han Dynasty has its most dense population in the area within the circle there, that core region, even in the Han Dynasty, only has a couple of regions that are outside of the modern nation of China, 
um, that'd be this little chunk, which is now in Korea, and this part down here, which is now part of Vietnam. So not very much of it gets lost over the course of the last 2,000 years. And if we just flip through the other dynasties, the Tang, the Northern Song, the Ming, and then, of course, the Qing, gives you a good sense of how much the Qing conquered that wasn't there before. Um, it's really clear that um, this political spatial unit persists pretty well throughout history. So this gives you the perception that this is a pretty natural unit, right? I mean, if the Roman Empire had stayed together for most of the last 2,000 years, we'd start thinking of it as a natural political unit with some kind of fundamental geographic significance which manifests itself. Now, if you're a modern Chinese nationalist historian, you love this idea, right? It basically justifies the existence of the modern nation of China as it's currently constituted. Um, now, historians, um, like myself or others, sometimes use a somewhat more delimited term like China proper to refer to this core chunk of territory. Um, because if you use the term China, you mean everything inside the purple outline here, which, you know, it's not what we typically mean. Um, but they often just call it China. Um, and we also have sub terms like North China Plain um, in order to describe parts of it. Really hard to find another term. My talk today is about South China. I try not to use terms like South China, but it's hard for me to find a short phrase that tells you what part of the world I'm talking about without having the word China in it, right? Um, in Chinese, there's a couple of different terms that might be used to refer to this territorial unit. There's a lot of possibilities, too. The most common are Zhongguo, which currently just means China, but of course in the past has other meanings. Um, the central states of the North China Plain. Um, another common term for this in earlier history is Tianxia, or All Under Heaven, which sometimes would be better translated as the Empire, um, but which historians frequently also translate as China. Um, and central to all of these ideas is the concept of unification, Tongyi. Um, in fact, the opening lines of one of traditional China's most beloved novels, The Romance of the Three Kingdoms, says, the empire long divided must unite, long united must divide. Thus, it has ever been, as if this was a natural unit that just came together and fell apart and came together again. Um, there's a certain historical inevitability to this idea. Um, now, early historical sources, of course, use the language of unification because they're written by the unifiers, right? So they obviously promote this idea. Um, and um, and present their military victories as desirable, natural, and inevitable. And obviously, the Chinese nationalist narrative also emphasizes this idea. But if modern historians adopt this kind of language, they're just reinforcing the ideology, ideology of political and spatial inevitability, right? If you know anything, you study historical methodology, you know that adopting ideas of teleology and inevitability in history is one of the great crimes. So how do we work ourselves out of this problem? Well, one way to do that is to start thinking in terms of a multicultural East Asia. Um, so an article a couple of years ago um, in the Journal of Asian Studies, um, the historian Hugh Clark crit criticizes this teleological concept of unified China. He's not the only one, but his article is a good example of this, and argues that at least up to the 10th century, these unified regimes are actually a superficial overlay on top of an East Asia that is composed of a lot of diverse cultural regions. Okay. So I take this up as an invitation to write meaningful histories of East Asian cultural regions and their distinctive peoples that are not a series of imperial national. There's a lot of work being done in this kind of thing. I'm hardly the only one or hardly even the most important one, but I have my own corner of this particular discourse. Um, so if we start by thinking about how do we draw a map of East Asia in the first millennium that's divided into a lot of cultural regions, I suggest it looks maybe something like this. There's a lot of ways that you can debate whether I've drawn this particularly well or not. The basic point is we need to think of a lot of different regions which the unified empires conquer and bring under one rule rather than just thinking them all as inevitably um, one thing or, or, or similar. Um, there are some larger scale dividing lines here, though, that are important. And in the, in the first millennium, I want to point out one in particular that really stands out, it seems to me. Um, and that's this line right here. This is not a line that we think of as particularly central to China in the second millennium. We would draw the line farther north along the Great Wall and the borders with the steppe nomads. But in the first millennium, this is an extremely important line, more or less lying along the Huai River and the Qinling, the Huai River 
in here, um, and the high drainage in the Chimney Mountain Range along here. Um, why do we pick this as a dividing line? Well, first of all, it is actually a cultural dividing line in this period that's pretty significant. If you go north of this line, the languages spoken are mostly Sinitic, or what we would call Chinese. Languages are also Altaic languages, those spoken in steppe regions. Um, and the primary diet is wheat, meat, and yogurt. North of this line, you can't grow wet field rice. Um, and so the North China Plain is mostly wheat and millet. Um, there's a lot of stock breeding. Um, and so it's completely evident from early medieval sources that northern diets predominated meat consumption, yogurt consumption, and other milk products. Again, you don't think of this as a traditional Chinese diet, right? Meat and yogurt products um, and wheat products, right? South of this line is both a linguistic and, a, and, a, and an agricultural divide. South of this line, we have what seems much more familiar, um, wet field rice, um, predominance of fish, um, and things like waterfowl, ducks, geese, other stuff that live in rice paddies. Um, and in the early medieval period, an increasing prevalence for tea as a very popular drink, which again, rose only in southern mountains um, and was therefore, and since there wasn't a lot of trade between south and north during this period, tea does not penetrate the north until the Tang Dynasty. Um, also in the south, the pro predominant local languages are Austroasiatic, to some extent Austronesian in some areas, also Thai languages. It's a complex mix of Southeast Asian languages. We have tend to have an assumption that everybody who's in China speaks Chinese, right? It's just like it's one language, everybody just speaks it, right? But of course, to use the term Chinese language is enormously misleading. There's not one Chinese language, it's a whole family of languages, like the Indo-European family of languages. Um, and in South China, the evidence from the Han Dynasty, when we have pretty good sources about this, it's quite clear that the Southern dialects are quite different from the ones that are spoken in the North. Um, and other kinds of linguistic research, which we don't have time to go, to go, go into here, suggest that much of the sort of Yangtze Valley and areas further south continue to have vernacular spoken languages that were non-Chinese languages, right? Now, over a very long period of time, having been occupied by Sinitic speaking peoples from the North, um, the upper class of those regions learned Sinitic languages so they could communicate and, and, and um, work with the imperial officials that were sent down, or in some very few cases, become officials themselves. So over time, those Southern languages get increasingly Sinified and they absorb a lot. No time to go into this, but if you look at the history of Vietnamese, the only language where we can really study this really well, you can see that Vietnamese has an enormous number of Sinitic loanwords and borrowwords. It's not a Sinitic language, uh, but it's borrowed an enormous amount of Sinitic structure, uh, Sinitic words um, and, uh, and um, pronunciation. To some extent, Japanese has done the same thing. Um, the languages of what we now call South China did the same thing and eventually became considered Sinitic languages. So now we think of languages like Minnan, for example, or Guangdonghua, um, Cantonese, um, or other Southern languages. We think of them as part of the Chinese language family, but they're actually quite different. And their relationship to, say, Vietnamese and other um, Austroasiatic languages is actually quite strong. Um, so in the period that I'm going to be focusing on in this talk, which is the period from the second to the sixth centuries, most of, South, of what we now call South China is speaking non-Semitic language. Classes may have learned some Semitic languages, but the lower classes probably were not speaking a Semitic language. Okay. So one helpful way, a shorthand that I use in the book and that I use here for these two zones is to call the northern one the sino steppe zone, meaning the area where the steppe and Semitic cultures mesh, and the southern part, the Sino-Southeast Asian zone. It has a lot of similarities to the rest of Southeast Asia in terms of its language, in terms of its agricultural systems, but it's been sinified by 400 years of occupation by the Han dynasty. Okay. Now, if we think about the large medieval empires and map them to this, we can see that the Han Empire is um, based in the Sino Steppe Zone, but conquers much of the Sino Southeast Asian Zone, renders its people militarily impotent and politically subordinate. Um, so instead of thinking about these as unified empires, we could just understand them being 
well, like every other world empire, right? I teach world history. Like, this is the way every world empire is. Some small region conquers a bunch of other regions. They're very subordinate. Most of the ruling class comes from just the four regions, which I've got in red here. Um, and the other regions are very subordinate to it. Um, so that ruling class, of course, preferentially doles out power to its own people. They use a rhetoric of unity and universalism to justify that operation, but everybody knows where the bread is buttered in the empire like this, right? And the Tang Empire is extraordinarily similar to the Han Empire in that basic structure. Um, However, for much of the first millennium, East Asia has a complicated multi-state diplomatic system and military rivalry. And so it actually looks like this, right? Where the Sino Steppe Empire is on one side, and there's a Sino Southeast Asian Empire, the Jian Kong Empire, on the other side. Um, this situation prevails for most of 400 years. I've given you a map in 500 CE, but more or less you have a situation like this from about 200 to, to 589. Um, now, one thing, um, oh, and, and, um, and a situation like this prevails again in the 10th century. It's a little different, more complicated, with more fractured south. Um, now, I'm going to go back to this picture. Now, one thing we know from the larger pattern of East Asian history, if we look at the long term, is that regions that resisted the control of large central plains based empires, like this one, um, eventually develop a strong local political and cultural identity, right? These includes regions that became the modern nation of Korea and in the second millennium, Vietnam, right? We go back to, um, you know, I won't give you a map of those. Um, and as well as to some extent, Japan, which was of course never under control of the central empire. So these local identities eventually come to be understood as ethnic ones, which are not Chinese, right? So in my recent book, this one, um, which Matt gave you, uh, held up for you. One important question I'm trying to confront is to what extent did a development like this, a development of an independent political and cultural identity, develop in the Jian Kong Empire, that is in the Sino Southeast Asian zone in the first millennium? You have 400 years. What happened in those 400 years? Um, did some of that kind of local identity develop? Um, My answer, of course, to that question is yes, but not exactly in the way you might expect it to. Um, and it certainly didn't develop into a strong ethnic identity. Uh, I probed that question. I'm not going to probe that very much today because it's complicated. But the basic answer to that is they didn't really become an ethnicity. But that doesn't mean they didn't do anything um, to develop an independent identity. Um, so just to step back a little bit and put this into a world historical context. So in the early fifth century, these are the four largest empires in the world by land area or by population. Um, the Jian Kong Empire is much larger than the Northern Empire by population, 25 to 30 million by my estimate, um, making it quite comparable to these, actually probably larger than any of these empires. Um, and its capital city is probably larger than any of these. The capital city of Jian Kong um, has a population of at least a half a million, may have peaked at 750 to 800,000. Um, and it held, and it, it held, or at least competed for the distinction of largest city in the world for several centuries until it got absolutely leveled um, following the Sui conquest, um, that is the Northern conquest. Um, so I want to understand the development of this large empire the way we would these other ones as an important political movement, um, and what it signifies. Now. Chinese history, this Jin Khan regime is identified as Chinese, right? In the standard narrative, these are called the Southern Dynasties, um, and they're just thought of as Chinese dynasties. As a matter of fact, they're thought of as more Chinese than the Northern Dynasty. Um, they're contrasted with those as being non-Chinese. The significance of the Southern Dynasties is usually um, as a kind of holding action, a place where traditional Chinese culture got preserved and hung around and waited until it could really flourish when the Sui and Tong took over and made China great and golden and glorious again. Um, this is exactly the sort of teleological history I'm trying to work against, right? So it assumes the political culture of Jian Kong is pretty much the same as the Bahan Empire or all the other Central Plains states, just badly executed, um, which is why they eventually got conquered. This renders any distinctive aspects of their political identity undesirable or invisible. Um, Instead, I want to try and think of them as an independent 
um, effort to try and build something new. Um, I'm going to do that briefly here in a lot more detail in the book through four different lenses. One is military strategy, one is imperial succession, one is political economy, and one is legitimate ideology. I'm going to go through these a little faster than I did this. Uh, let's start with military strategy. I, I'm giving you kind of a quick summation. Was unification a primary goal? Did the Southern dynasties want to unify China and make it into one great thing again? And they just were bad at it? <laughs> That's the usual explanation. Um, it's usually the Jin Kong regime is usually described as having an immigrant government of northerners whose conception of the world was completely focused on the idea of a unified China. Their military objectives were focused on retaking the north and reunifying all of China. So the fact they didn't do that just means they were weak and they failed. But scholars who actually just study the military history of Jin Kong come to different conclusions. Except for a couple of chaotic generations in the mid fourth century, the Jin Kong regime was almost entirely focused on defending its north front northern frontier against invasion from the Sino Steppe regimes. In other words, it had a primary defensive mindset. Why? Because the Sino Steppe regimes control the supply of horses. Um, and if you don't know the world of military history, the horse is essentially. Um, like the Blitzkrieg tank of ancient times, right? The horse is by far the most valuable piece of military equipment there is. The Northerners had a ton of them, the Southerners had very few. So there's a huge military imbalance from that perspective. Um, so the Jihad regime structures its defense using a combination of fortified garrisons and river-based logistics that could bring forward a reserve of infantry um, and defend its northern frontier. At its greatest extent in the early fifth century um that northern frontier is along the yellow river but for most of the time it was along the much more defensible line of the Huai river which is the southern part of the yellow zone here the yellow zone represents a kind of the kind of borderland that got fought over for most of the time when they were unusually weak for a couple of periods the frontier was all the way down on the Yangtze river but for most of the time it's somewhere in this yellow zone um there was a Basically, and y'all can ask me questions if you know this history in detail, but basically there was no significant effort, effort ever made to extend the regime's control. So wait a minute, if the Jin Kong regime was dominated by northern immigrants and they were obsessed with the idea of unification, why did they make more effort to retake the north? Most claim that the regime was just not very good. But I would offer a different interpretation. The extent of northern, first of all, that the extent of northern immigrant influence on the Jin Kong regime is greatly overestimated. And you can map on this in the book. The usual figure comes from a 1934 article by Tan Shishan, which says about a one sixth of the southern population were northern immigrants. Um, more recent work, together with the work that I did in the book, suggests we're actually looking at an immigrant population of maybe half a million against a population of the South at the time of maybe 10, 11 to 13 million. So immigrants are maybe four or five percent of the population. That's a far cry from one sixth. Um, and even that figure overstates the probable impact. Why? Because half a million includes everybody north of the Huai River, right? But who are those people really, right? Uh, no more than half of them are from the Central Plains region here, um, and therefore would be considered carriers of Central Plains culture uh, that is represented best by the city of Luoyang. Most of them, if they weren't in the capital, um, adapted to the culture of the South and the capital, which I'll get to in a second, um, but didn't transform Southern vernacular culture more generally. So there's not some huge wave that turns the South um, into Northerners um, from this. The other half of the migrants are from the region of Eastern Chu, which is here. It's on the borderlands. Um, mostly military men, little or no education, no prior service to the unified regimes in Luoyang. Um, no particular investment in the Northern Plains or in Luoyang or in any of that Chinese stuff. Um, they, in fact, don't even speak the language of the central area. It's very clear from the sources that there's a language understood as Chu vernacular language, which is not the same as this one. Northern is a barbarian language. Uh, the people that spoke it sounded like twittering birds um, as they thought about all of the Southern languages. Um, 
the um, some of the most important founders of the Eastern Jin regime in the early fourth century that Matt works on um, were speakers of true vernacular, the founder of the Song regime um, that eventually takes over in the early fifth century. Um, was a speaker of true vernacular, so were all of his brothers, so were all of the people that worked for him, and another speaker of true vernacular descended from that group eventually leads, becomes the emperor um, in the later 5th and 6th centuries. Pretty much all the emperors in the 5th and 6th centuries are from true, or from even further south. Um, so, um, I, and most of the fighting men as well were from the true borderlands. So once we understand this, Instead of claiming that these are carriers of northern culture, what we really should think of is, well, maybe they fought and put up a defensive barrier through here because they're defending their own homelands, right? Why should they be interested in taking this territory? They just want to defend their own territory and quit, right? Um, and so um, if you look at the military campaigns from that lens, you understand that most of the military campaigns in the 5th and 6th century seem to have this as an objective not this. So that's not unification, that's building a defensive line right along that Y frontier, which remember is a linguistic, agricultural, cultural frontier in every way, um, and keeping them from conquering. Okay? So that's a very different mindset than unification. Um, okay. Now let's think about, imperial, about whether the government is dominated by civilians, who are very much from the northern plain, as many of them are, or by the military, which, as I just pointed out, is mostly these uneducated term border people, right? Um, to think about this, I'm going to look at the question of imperial succession. Um, and one of the ways you can see um, how the political system of the South works is that the civilian element, the northern immigrant element, is increasingly marginalized. So by the fifth and sixth centuries, it's either been marginalized or it's been thoroughly, let's say, Giancanized, maybe. It's been southernized, right? Um, so I, I, I look at this through the lens of imperial succession. There's a lot, I, I do a couple different things, but let's look, just look at imperial succession. So imperial succession in the South was terrible, um, and they had a lot of civil wars fighting over how to succeed to the throne. Um, and the problems raised were rooted in two two basic facts. One is that you have to be supported by the military in order to be the emperor, right? So if we're used to thinking about Chinese empire as civilian dominated, you sort of think from, say, the middle periods of the Han or Tang empires, where you have, where primogeniture means that the first son inherits the throne and you just go from, from father to son and father to son in a relatively systematic way. So we all know if you actually study the Han and Tang dynasty, it doesn't work that way some of the time, but it works that way a fair amount of the time because you have a relatively strong civilian government that can keep a relatively weak eldest son on the throne, even if he's not that good, um, and, and make the system go. Um, in Jing Kong, that doesn't happen. In Jing Kong, the ruler, the, the, the emperor has to have military support or he can't sit on the throne. Um, as I'll point out in just a second. The other element that's a problem is that they adopted the Han imperial practice of sequestering the designated heir at the capital. That is, whereas all of his brothers, sons, cousins, and everybody else all got a military campaign and went out to the provinces of their troops, the designated heir, the eldest son, was kept at the capital. What does that mean? He's got no power base. Right? He's got no military men to know who he is or trust him at all. Right? What does that mean? It means every designated heir gets deposed within about a year of taking the throne. Right? So you can sort of miss this pattern if you read typical dynastic histories because they aren't set up to show you this. Um, but if you look at, I, this is sort of out of the book, if you look at from 420 um, all the way to 589, I basically put them in 12 cycles. And in most of these cycles, what happens is you have a ruler here, um, his eldest son and designated heir takes over, and within a few months, a year, two years at most, he gets overthrown in a coup, and some guy who actually has military power takes over. Mm -hmm. These guys are all in the dynastic histories. All of them are relatives. They all have names like the, the former deposed emperor, the later deposed emperor, the small <laughs> emperor. And there's a ton of language about how they're drunkards, crazy religious fanatics, sex themes, some horrible thing that totally justified them being deposed. 
don't be fooled. They got the post because they didn't have the military backing. These guys did. <laughs> right? Um, maybe, even, maybe they were drunkards and sex things too. I don't know. But I certainly wouldn't trust the history from that score. Okay. So um, there are three. There's 12 cycles like this. Three of them actually do go to the designated air. The other nine don't. Right? Um, so the question is, how, how do the people who don't follow primogeniture suggestion, what happens to them? Well, so in six, so there's 10 cases, there's 10 cases where somebody not the eldest son um, is the next ruler, right? This is, there's 12 cycles, there's only 10 of them, and 10 of the 12, the next ruler is not the eldest son. Who is, well, in some cases, it's somebody close to an eldest son, a third son, a younger brother, a set of son, a nephew, like a fairly close agnate kin, right? So you think of six to 10, and that's not bad. 40% of the time is somebody who's far away. In two cases, somebody who has no relationship. In two cases, a third cousin and a fourth cousin. Damn near no relationship, right? Same surname. Um, what that tells you is that, sure, it helps to be a brother or a son or something of the current emperor, but actually four times out of 10, even a random, any random guy, essentially, who has substantial military power successfully takes the throne in this coup. That suggests a very unstable system in which the military, whose backing is essential for all of this, not only doesn't care about primogeniture, they don't even care that much about whether you're part of the imperial household, right? As long as you have gained their trust, they'll follow you, right? So the imperial household doesn't exactly have a lot of um, awe-inspiring power amongst the military, right? They're interested in people with a different kind of charisma or a different kind of prowess. And I'll give you another example that just sort of, I think, really proves this case. Let's look at the three cases where the designated heir actually does succeed, right? We're going to skip this one because he gets overthrown by the Sway conquest before anybody can overthrow him, so they did try. Let's look at the other two. In these two cases, the designated heir actually does take over from his father. In both cases, the father is a dynastic founder. When he founds the dynasty, he's already old, at least in his 40s, and his son's been out fighting with him for, uh, for at least a decade, right? Has his own coterie of military supporters and can easily win the support of his father's military supporters because they already know who he is and they fought with him already, right? These are the only two times when the designated heir succeeds. And they're the only two times where a designated heir was not sequestered and was actually out in the field and had military support. So the pattern seems pretty clear. If you don't have military backing, you're not going to be able to be the emperor. You're never going to make it if you just have the previous emperor's approval or support from the court aristocracy or whatever it is. Okay, so what's the military looking for? Well, to understand this question, I actually go to Southeast Asian history because remember I called this area Sino-Southeast Asia? It has a lot of patterns that you can see as being similar to patterns in Southeast Asia. So. Um, one important idea is from W. Walter is the idea of the man of prowess, right? Prowess meaning um, if you're in the Southeast Asian zone that's not part of China, which I'll call the Indo-Southeast Asian zone, the area where Sanskrit predominates in Southeast Asia, that goes all the way to most of Island Southeast Asia, that means a Shiva-like sort of spiritual potency um, and um, but you can also look at an example of Vietnam in the 10th to 14th centuries, right? Which is a part of Sino Southeast Asia that has its own political system. And there, prowess is clearly connected to the idea of this, which in Mandarin we pronounce the, and it means we pronounce duk. Pardon me if anyone knows Vietnamese, my Vietnamese pronunciation is probably terrible. But, um, so, what is, so, what does that entail? Um, in Vietnamese, it means military and spiritual power prowess, including the power to attract local spirits and heavenly gods. Now, if you're used to studying Confucian, meaning virtue in the typical Confucian ideals of sort of self-restraint and scholarly work um, and sort of being able to inspire others. Um, but even in people who study Confucian philosophy, some would translate the as um, as a kind of charisma or suasive power, ability to persuade others. Um, it's just that in the Confucian idea, that is supposed to be about your sort of personal moral virtue in the Confucian vein. But plenty of other cultures, including um, early Vietnam, would have translated the meaning your ability to call down spirits or your ability to fight really effectively, right, is also a kind of virtue 
um, that it, or prowess, I'm going to call it prowess, which I think is more helpful here. So in a very similar kind of way, um, geocon political culture is dominated by personal relationships, um, with the most powerful leaders demonstrating personal prowess, possessing the biggest network of military clients, and the struggle for succession is a pitched competition between um, men of prowess and their military clients. But unlike other parts of Southeast Asia, in the GECOM regime, there's also this court bureaucracy that functions um, in a sort of systematic sort of Confucian style, we might say, um, which is kind of uneasily grafted together, right? This is actually a, a, a difficult balance. Um, you sort of have to win support from both sides. You must have support from this side. If you get enough support from this side and you look like you're inevitable, this side will probably fall in line. They usually do. Um, okay. This whole political culture, and I try to pull in the 10th century because I think it's really instrumental to see this here. This whole political culture seems to show up again in the 10th century. Um, uh, Hugh Clark characterizes the leaders in this period as scoundrels, rogues, and refugees, which I think is a good, good description. Their biographies sound very much like the biography of dynastic founders in the early medieval period. Um, and the succession troubles are just the same. In the Wu regime, you saw usurpation by a non-relative within a generation. You see the same thing in these two southern regimes. In these three southern regimes, there was a civil war due to succession struggles between brothers. This weakened all of these regimes. The only one that actually manages to have a pretty regular succession is the Wu Ye regime. Okay. It's already 11.42. How much longer before you want me to shut up? Ten? Oh, I get ten? Okay. I'm a really politically kind. I love politically kind. Don't have much time to ask a question about it. Go ahead and ask a question about it. The key point of political economy is we tend to think of a traditional Chinese political economy in the Han or the Tang dynasties as based on um, uh, a very good census of, of, of households, um, of taxes that are based on population and particularly on agriculture and grain production. Um, most of those taxes are collected in grain and cloth. Um, and um, and there's can tend to discourage the commercial economy by and large and don't raise very much money from it. They also don't have a lot of coin in it, as we'll get to in a minute. Um, so whereas when you go to the Southern Dynasties or the Jin Empire, everything is different, right? It functions in a very different way. One of the most important ideas is remittances or Hanzo, um, which means when you're sent out to a province, you're supposed to collect an enormous amount of money from the province. And when you get back to the capital, you give a big chunk of it to the emperor in gratitude for being sent out, right? You might call that corruption. <laughs> but it's important to understand that the Roman Empire functions almost exactly the same way, right? This is not an unusual way for a large world empire to function, right? When a Roman aristocrat was sent out to the provinces, he got fabulously wealthy, and then he and then he came back and handed it out to all of his supporters, right? We know this is the case here. Several dozen accounts of this um, from the histories of the Jin Kong Empire. Um, uh, one ruler says to one of his men, one of his men comes back and is very fawning and is like, I want to give all the money to you. And the emperor says, oh, you should be French on your private income. I'll split the proceeds with you, right? And so, um, so clearly this is a well-established custom, right? This is not some random thing. This is how the empire functions. Why does it function this way? Because clients are expensive, right? Their clients and ladies require a lot of provisioning. They have hundreds of uncultured clients and have to be fed every day, right? You have to take care of all of them and then follow you around. You need a lot of money to do that. Um, so we have all kinds of quotes from the Southern histories that suggest this kind of universe. Your clients actually get their own assets through their own. I hate the word corruption because it sounds so negative, right? This is just the way it functions, right? This is not, no, nobody saw this. Well, I shouldn't say nobody. Guys writing imperial histories didn't like it very much. But most of the people who participated just understood this is how this is how things work. When you got appointed to a position, you got to profit from being in that position, right? I'll skip this one though. It's in addition, the imperial household and their officials were supposed to or routinely engaged in commerce, right? They engaged in commercial activities. Their commercial activities were exempt from tax. Like, there's a nice, there's a nice bonus for you. They invested in pawn shops, they invested in trading houses. The Qi Emperor Wu, well, he's still the heir designate, trained silk to Southeast Asia. Right? Um, they invested their profits from the provinces in tradable goods, which you could send to the capital and make a killer. Uh, they invested in real estate and then grew, um, grew commercial crops on that real estate and sold them for money, right? Um, so um, 
They also monetized imperial revenue. Um, so we know um, from a northern historian, a northern historian complains about this saying, oh, the Jin Kong officials esteem taxes on markets and stores, while our government, this is the northern Sino step regime here, is broad and rich and you don't need to collect contributions of grain and cloth. Sounds great when you think about the room. That means you don't have a commercial economy, and they do, right? So he's trying to make a silk purse out of the sow's ear here, right? Um, and the regime pursues pro-commercial policies. Why? Because most of their tax revenue, I would suggest at least half, maybe two-thirds, comes in coin. It comes in money, right? Not in grain, not in cloth. It comes in money from tax and commercial transactions. To give you a comparison, the Tang dynasty, which is often considered the pinnacle of commerce and trade in Chinese history, um, is, in at least the first half of the Tang dynasty, peaks at maybe eight or nine percent of its revenues come in cash. Jin Kong's running with 50 to 70 percent of its revenues in cash in coin, right? Um, so they pursue monetary policies that emphasize high liquidity. Why? Because there's not enough coin in circulation. Commercial economy is so buoyant in the South that they can't keep up with producing enough coin to support it. So they engage in a whole variety of strategies to try and deal with this problem, right? One thing they never get very good at is going out and mining a heck of a lot of copper, which would have helped the, the later Song Dynasty, the one from the 10th to the 14th century, does that. It doesn't solve the problem for them either. Um, one thing they try instead is iron coins. They make coins out of iron. Takes a lot of them to buy anything, but it's really helpful for low-level commerce, right? And if you're going to tax, you want the tax, you want the commerce to be in coins, and you can tax a percentage of it, right? Um, they also engage in a whole variety of free trade policies, which I won't go into. But they're very interested in free trade. Why? Because it made more profit for the government, since the government revenue is dependent on commercial taxes. It also gave you a lot more opportunity to, you know, make some money for yourself. Mm -hmm. You can compare this very well, I think, to the maritime states of Southeast Asia, which were also highly monetized, in their case, from gold and silver mostly, um, and were also highly focused on maritime trade. You can also compare well to the 10th century Southern Kingdoms, which as soon as they were done with the Tang occupation and became independent, started, started producing iron coinage again, right? And trying to make their, and make, make their economies more trade-oriented. Really good example of this. I'm really into shipwrecks these days. So, um, Caravan Shipwreck in, in uh, Southeast Asia um, has a cargo of like 120,000 ceramics being shipped from Mumbai Kingdom down to Java, for example. Extremely commercially astute by its time. Okay, let's do the last part of the main repertoires. Okay. Well, basically, the point here, and this is an extended argument, is about whether the southern regimes prioritize the Han imperial legacy or the Confucian legacy, you might say, of the Han Empire, or whether they're moving towards local and Buddhist alternatives. Um, this answer is complicated. They certainly do not reject the Han imperial legacy, um, but they also do try alternatives, right? Um, and they try to blend alternatives. And I would say by the sixth century, they're clearly moving very sharply away from a, the Han imperial legacy and looking at other ways of legitimating their empire because the Han imperial legacy, well, has a lot of problems, um, which is really worth thinking through. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm going to run out of time because this last section. Do you want to plow through it or give it up? Mm -hmm. uh, if you can kind of do I'll, an overview. I'll give you a quick here's, here's the way I would think about it, right? I, I think about three different repertoires, right? Three different ways you might think about legitimating your, your regime, right? One is the sort of Central Plains-based Sinitic ideal, right? That's really a base in the Han Empire, but also the succeeding way and then the unified Jin Empire. So sort of represent a certain idea of what an empire is supposed to look like, right? Um, there's also the tradition of the Wu region, that is the Yangtze Delta, where the capital is, right? Here, you don't look back at the Central Plains-based empires, you look back at the Three Kingdom state of Wu, and they're was the opponent of the Wei and Jin, right? So I mean, he's the enemy. He's the upstart enemy from the south, right? But there's plenty of evidence that you look back to this regime as a founding regime for the Jin Kong Empire, right? Some very different conceptualizations than this one. Um, it's not dominant, but it's important. Um, a third alternative is to look at Buddhism, right? There you look all the way back to the reign of the Emperor Ashoka in central India in the third century BCE and the idea of a Chakravarta and then a the whole lot of sort of Buddhist ideas for how you might justify your regime. So I basically I go through these and try to weigh 
which ones are important. So maybe universalism we all know is important. I'm basically trying to problematize that and say the other ones are also important. Um, I look in particular at the um, god, um, the god Zhang Zuan, um, or Emperor Zhang, um, who is basically, I argue, a proxy for the founder of the state of Wu, and who's worshipped for the whole 400 years. Um, he's promoted to emperor, he brings rain, um, his tomb is just outside of town, uh, of Jin Kong, right, by, right next to the tomb of Sun Chan. There's major, um, uh, 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 major rituals held there um, in order to celebrate it all the way through to the very end of the dynasty. Um, so he's clearly an extremely important figure, and I would say represents uh, this vernacular Wu tradition against the Central Plains based tradition. Um, of course, the more important one is Buddhism, which has several advantages. Um, it's more flexible about where you're supposed to be. The sort of Confucian classics always point to the Central Plains up here as the center of any civilized empire. So if you come from anywhere else, they're kind of hard to use because you're not at that center. Um, Buddhism is much more, uh, uh, doesn't really point to any part of the world as necessarily being the center of a Buddhist empire. Any place could be it. Um, um, so um, it's also less explicit about how to conduct your political affairs. The Confucian classics have a lot of detail about how you're supposed to conduct political affairs. Buddhist classics don't actually say a hell of a lot about it. So a lot of it's kind of put together over time, especially in India and Southeast Asia. Um, and it's also just more cosmopolitan. If you're really interested in maritime trade with the rest of with this part of the world, then you're really dealing in a Buddhist, um, a Buddhist and Semitic framework rather than a traditional Confucian one. Um, so I make some arguments about this idea of a theater state, um, which using Stanley Tambia's Reformation of Gears um, suggests that the most important thing for ruling is not through inherited status, um, but through ostentatious performance of public acts of piety. Karma containments and works of public welfare prowess, that I was talking about before. And you can really see this, you can see this in, in Southeast Asia at the time. Um, I used the example of Sri Lanka, which was already using very ostentatious public ceremonies about worshiping a tooth relic, a Buddhist tooth relic. It's an example from the 1880s. They still have some in Sri Lanka, um, but they were doing this already in the fourth and fifth centuries. Jin Kang Emperor was totally aware of this, had good reports of it. Um, people coming back from there reporting on how Buddhist states were organized, and they try to organize themselves. Similarly, based on I would argue Sri Lanka, perhaps Funan, which is a major empire in southern Cambodia. Um, and he went through a series of ritual reforms, the, the core idea of which, there's, there's a lot of key ideas in here, but the part that I'm interested in is that they get increasingly public. Right? Traditional Confucian rituals are done for court, for court officials, not for the public, right? The most celebrated Confucian rituals are really done in private spaces for court officials. They're not big ostentatious things that you do for the public. <laughs> Buddhist rituals? No. Um, they start in the imperial palaces in the early sixth century. They move it from the imperial palace out to a brand new enormous complex where you can have 10,000 people watching with the public ceremonies this kind and it's outside the imperial palace but still in the core city. And then eventually by the 530s, they move the whole operation to Chang'an Temple, which is way outside the main city and is based in the commercial district down here, right? So now they move from a very court-centered kind of ritual to a very public, very ostentatious ritual. People doing, people immolating themselves, food being distributed. This is sort of a huge public thing. This is really unusual in most of Chinese history. This is not the way most empires function in Chinese history. So they're really moving towards a model of imperial power that they've seen in South and Southeast Asia and are trying to adopt, I would argue, um, in Jiang Khan. Um, um, I think the accession of Chen Wu Di in 557 is a great example of this. If you just look at his priorities, he sees the imperial throne on the second day, he goes and reverences Zhang Tuan, right? Um, and then he has a procession of the Buddhist tooth relic and holds a boundless gathering, which is a giant sort of feast for everybody who shows up, which could have been hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and then on the 7th and 14th, right? but he knows what's important here, right? just keeping the public satisfied. Um, I'll skip the fourth banner icon, which is super interesting. I'll also point out that by this time we have a key Buddhist icon, which is central to the throne. They actually kept it in the Chang'an Temple and they had an annual procession of it, which went up the main avenue to the Imperial Palace. It's exactly like the Buddhist tooth relic worship in Sri Lanka at the time. Um, and in fact, if you look at characteristics of sacred images that legitimate Southeast Asian monarchs, um, these four characteristics 
the key characteristics of, of the Jian Kong relics, tooth relics, or the, the Buddha images um, have all the same properties. Um, and in fact, the Wuya King in the 900s actually follows forward with a lot of these things. Um, so their relics are very similar to the ones in Jian Kong and very similar to the Emerald Buddha in Thailand, which down in Tommy that pretty much is one of those two relics in Sri Lanka. So they really borrow a whole kind of political culture and language from South and Southeast Asia. It's not from the Northern Plains. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> Sorry, that went too long, but I would really love to take questions. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of drowning of all that. <laughs> It's not from uh, the uh, from the uh, from the chat here. I'm waiting and see if anybody has any questions from the chat. But it was something that you mentioned right at the beginning, and I was trying to remember earlier when you when you arrived how long it is that I've been listening to you talk about this. And the more that I listened to you, the more incredibly persuaded by it I became. To the point where, in my intro to Chinese culture class, which is often kind of a blow by blow sort of go through each dynasty and hit a different genre of literature and yada yada, right? Like very kind of straightforward. Um, I stopped using the term China mm -hmm. in, in the class at all. I didn't put it included in the syllabus. I didn't, I didn't put it anywhere. Um, it was incredibly hard to do. Oh, it's such a struggle. Uh, it's so hard. And so um, do you find, uh, so I guess just maybe more of a question about teaching as opposed to the contents of the lecture, which is like, how do you find the reception of students toward thinking about East Asia like this, or what I would think of as mainland East Asia, or great, you know, and 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 uh, do do they do they come away when you when you maybe introduce this topic to any of your students? Do they come away with it feeling like they have a better critical tool to think about this area with? Like, what do you like? What's is there any kind of impact that you see in terms of your own undergraduate teaching with this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in a couple of ways. Um, first of all, I think in some ways, like 18 year olds are more ready to hear this than people that have been studying China for 20, 30, or 40 years. Like, they're sort of used to China as a thing, right? Um, and now, anymore, anytime anyone talks about China, if not if they're dealing with the present, obviously, but if they're dealing with the more distant past, I'm like, there wasn't any China. <laughs> which I don't mean to offend anybody who's really dedicated to contemporary China, which is absolutely a thing. But when you're dealing with the period that I'm working in, right, thinking in terms of China is a real problem. And the students, because they probably haven't thought a heck of a lot about early East Asian history, right, um, they're, they're going to absorb it the way you hand it to them. Um, so um, in that sense, I think my effort to try and reframe it is helpful, right? Um, so, for example, I used to have, so most of the students at Eckerd College, there's a lot more students that are in Japan than in China, right? So my East Asian tradition survey, which does all of East Asia, spends more time on China than it does on Japan. It'd be much larger, right? So, I mean, China's a lot of different regions. And I think the fact that I've decentered the China-ness from it and actually talk about the South and the North and the steppe lands and the interior and other parts, and then, you know, what we now call Korea and Japan as being other regions and Vietnam being other regions, that multi-regional thing, I think, helps them understand, you know, how the empires are, you know, temporary thing. Another thing that's really helpful for me is I'm also in the history program, so I teach a class, I'm just finishing both of them up right now, called Big History, which is kind of a massive world history survey, right? Except it isn't really a world history survey, it's actually just sort of looking at interesting big ideas in history. We think about comparative empire, for example, and other stuff. Or what China means, I knew it the whole time. Uh, I mean, it's, it's central to how I'm doing everything um, because it's a comparative world thing, right? And then you start doing a comparative world structure. This is why the book is about Jian Kong Empire and Chinese and world history. Because once you start doing comparative world, world history, you recognize how the Chinese empires, I'm calling that, look like other world empires in that 
they are they are they're not a nation state they're not they're not reigning over a single ethnic group so the minute you use terms like chinese for all the people inside that empire you completely misrepresented what it is um and you wouldn't do that with any other empire right i mean can you imagine a roman empire where you just described the people living in egypt as roman you can but only if the roman citizens you got to qualify that right um so you don't it's easy for us to think about that with other empires, and we're just totally clouded when we think about the early Chinese empires. And so for me, restructuring the language to represent that actually in the world history class is the only way you can make sense out of China. And in the East Asia class, I think does help decenter the Chineseness and put the different sub-regions of East Asia into dialogue with, uh, with each other in a more interesting kind of way. Yeah. Then I have a question from the great from the um internet here does the four to five percent estimate of ethnic Han population in south china upon gene transfer to jiankang include the descendants of northern chinese who had settled in Wu earlier for example during the Han dynasty good question um first of all not to mince words on language i wouldn't call them han ethnic because there isn't really a strong ethnic identity yet in north china the, when exactly it shows up it's not clear but i certainly would put it as early as the fourth century um i would just say people who lived in the central plains um does it include the earlier ones no it doesn't um it's it's all but impossible to estimate the earlier ones bielenstein tried bielenstein tried and i basically took him apart on that one i feel like i did anyway i don't know um you just can't estimate how many settled in earlier periods what i would say is as opposed to just sort of thinking in terms of numbers of immigrants the real question is what kind of impact do immigrants actually have right so there's a certain presumption that if you migrate from the north china plain to the south you retain all of your culture you don't absorb any local culture and instead you transform the southern culture right if you know the famous um statement in the Analects about Confucian fleeing, Confucius fleeing to the barbarians and basically making them all into gentlemen, it's the same idea. But in real immigration, it doesn't happen that way. If small numbers of northerners trickle into the south over long periods of time, they're going to absorb southern culture. They're not going to make all the southerners speak a northern Semitic language. They're going to speak the language of the people that they live with. They're not going to teach them how to do wheat agriculture and, and herd cows because you can't do that in the South. They're the ones that have to learn how to grow rice, yeah. right? So they're going to absorb Southern culture. So, so is the migration of those, that early like, trickle of migrants from the North to the South transforming the South in some significant way? I would say probably not. Um, they mostly just get absorbed into Southern culture, right? Now, I try to set up in the book a kind of way of thinking about this, like when do immigrants have a transformative kind of effect on a culture? It tends to be when they move in a big wave at a clump at a time, when they stay together, when they practice marital endogamy, when they only marry one another. And so you can see evidence of those kinds of behaviors in the fourth century, but you don't see evidence for those behaviors in earlier centuries. So I would say the earlier migrations of northerners um, are not significant in the sense that they don't transform southern culture into something else the fourth century ones are a big way and are significant and so you have to figure out what, what is their significance again i argue their impact on vernacular culture is probably not very significant but they do bring things like seer culture and certain um certain bean crops and other stuff to the south but um the real impact is at the core and that is a significant impact but also not as transformative as it's usually given credit for if you're a future historian hundreds of years from now, how would you look at the current period? You mean right now? <laughs> like what's going on in China right now? <laughs> you are in the future, looking back at this future historian. I mean, well, there's, a, there's a lot going on right now. Uh, oh, so this is just some main themes that are repeating in a different way because of technology and other things, but. <laughs> So here's one way of thinking about it that I think is interesting. Um, one of the things that my book is really dealing with, is we've taken a whole talk to explain, um, is the question of ethnogenesis. That is, what do we, how do we think of sort of ethnic groups and ethnic cohesion, right? I argue in the first millennium, there basically isn't much ethnogenesis in East Asia. They form bonds and form identities in other ways that are mostly not ethnic, mostly. Um, 
So one of the things you can see in the 19th and 20th centuries is a real effort to develop a much stronger idea of ethnicity, right? So the idea of a Han Chinese people, right? It really develops a lot in the late 19th and 20th centuries. There's a real effort to develop that identity as a strong identity as it is now, right? So that's been a successful effort. Um, so, um, and there's, you know, so, and the marrying of that sort of development of building an ethnic identity to building a strong national identity, a sense of national unity is extremely important in China now. So I really see a lot of this, um, the, the interesting parallel for me is actually Taiwan, right? Um, because Taiwan bears, as I briefly note at one point in the book, but don't make an issue out of it, Taiwan bears some similarity to the Jin Kong Empire in some ways, right? It has a population that came over from the mainland in a wave um, that was relatively coherent, relatively urban, with a high level of political impact compared to its numbers. Um, and um, and you might also argue that over time, that um, the, the majority of the people, the vernacular population, the people that didn't come over from the mainland, eventually reassert their political authority, as they have done, um, and begin to sort of think of themselves as something different from the mainland, right? And begin to develop an identity as Taiwanese, not Chinese, right? Which is, which is something which is going on in Taiwan right now. Now, that doesn't happen in the Jiang Kong Empire in the same way, because I would argue the whole idea of ethnicity and framing your life around ethnic identity is simply not done in East Asia in this period, right? In the early period. Um, so the idea of sort of formulating your identity through eth an ethnic lens is not predominant. So you don't see that development. Um, but you do see that development in, in Taiwan now. So um, one thing I would say if I were a future historian looking back at this period is how did that work out? We don't know yet. Um, I'll be interested to see how it works out. Um, I, I, I hope peacefully. Um, but in any case, um, so I see that effort to create a strong unified ethnic identity on the one hand, and on the other hand, an effort to sort of, you know, create your own distinctive identity. Something which I would argue to some extent happened for Korea and Vietnam at much earlier periods. And you can see some initial trajectory in the Jiang Kong Empire some, not very much, um, before it gets cut off. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answered your question. Yes, yes, yes. Took it, took it. It's hard to get. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is indeed. Mm -hmm. It is indeed. Mm -hmm. If I could do it, I, you know, I'd just do that for a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I've got a question about the map of China. Mm -hmm. It looks like the south is pretty far north of China, mm -hmm. if we look at it today. Mm -hmm. and it's certainly north of Shanghai mm -hmm. from that. And so I'm kind of wondering how far it actually goes up. But added to that, um, I'm assuming that Mandarin is spoken in the north, northern part of China, and Shanghai East is in the south. Mm -hmm. Is there any distinction to just because of language? So a couple of things. First of all, Jiang Kong that I've been talking about, I didn't say this, probably should have. Jiang Kong is modern Nanjing, same location, right? So just, just up from Shanghai in a larger, larger view of things, um, relatively short ride by bullet train. Um, so, uh, so yeah, you're right. I mean, just geographically, half of what we now call China is south of there. Um, and so the Jiang Kong Empire, I call it an empire because it controls a lot of territory that's way outside the capital and is just as colonially controlled as it would be in, you know, in northern empires in some ways. Um, so how you think about a region like Sichuan, for example, or Guangdong province, or Jiaozhou, which is northern Vietnam, all of which were part of the empire, those are quite different and quite distant. Um, I don't say very much about those in the book because it is extremely difficult to say very much about those in this medieval period because there isn't anybody from those regions that wrote anything. Um, we don't have any idea about how they developed an identity or anything. So at that point, we're just, we just have to look at archaeology very different way of thinking about the problem than dealing with text, which is what I'm trying to do. Um, in terms of the languages, one of the things is, that's also hard to sort of wrap your head around is how much language transformation has been in East Asia um, 
since the time that I'm talking about. Not only have, so for example, Chinese, which is known as Wu, I mean, is, is not the Wu language of this period, right? It's gone through many transformations since that time. Um, and so um, it's even, even in the period that I'm talking about, there's a language spoken in the Jinkan region, which is much more Semitic than the language of any place else. In the in the empire, still different from northern, um, but it's much closer than in the language spoken anywhere else. Um, and it's off the northerners call it Wu, uh, but southerners wouldn't call it Wu. Southerners would have called the proper Wu language, which was spoken further south in the area around like Suzhou and Hangzhou. Um, but all of that's been transformed. The Yangtze Delta region has had seen waves of people go through it and transformation of its language history. Um, so modern Shanghainese is not that language. Modern Mandarin, <sighs> I'm not skilled enough to give you a complete layout of how modern Mandarin came to be, but it did exist in this period. Uh, modern Mandarin is uh, an evolution that took the whole second millennium, basically, um, to get into its current form, including the impact of the Mongols and especially the mansions, um, in order to, to, to turn into its current form. No languages at the time I'm talking about are modern Mandarin. Um, they've managed to reconstruct the language of the like the Sui early Tang period um, pretty well, um, and it's pronounced quite differently from modern Mandarin. But that's only, all, all that is is the reconstruction of the court language of the early Tang. Doesn't tell you anything about all the vernacular languages that were spoken in all the rest of the empire, which varied enormously. Those didn't ever get written down, so we don't know. You know things keep changing. I used to live in Hong Kong a long time ago, and no one spoke Mandarin there at all. Right. Right? Right. And it was between the Shanghai dialect and the Cantonese. Right. The local people spoke Cantonese, and a lot of Shanghai people came down from right. Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And they, they couldn't talk in the office. They, you know, the two couldn't talk in Chinese. And there's some argument. Language. There's some argument that those southern languages bear more resemblance to medieval spoken languages than Mandarin does. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I'm not a good enough linguist to answer those questions, but um, but it's important to keep in mind how much linguistic change there's been over the over the centuries. There's someone in the audience here. Have one more question. We have one yeah, more question one. here on volume. Please. Not somebody just wanted to know uh, whether the concept of reverence for ancestors is that uh, kind of more of a southern thing or a northern thing, or is it kind of equal during this period? It kind of is. So. Um, it, I, I'm not sure I could sort of weigh where it's more important. It's absolutely important in the South, right? It absolutely is. Um, there's no question that, I mean, my, my book and my talk tend to lean towards finding the areas which are different, right? Because the assumption that the South is just Chinese um, and looks like all other Chinese dynasties is what I'm working against, mostly in terms of its political culture, more than its sort of, um, sort of, than its sort of lived culture. There is no question, however, that 400 years of rule by the Han Empire um, and a, a, a very high level of reference for the Confucian classes. So, I mean, honestly, they, you know, the literate classes um, were, of course, literate in written Sinitic. They knew all of the classics and the histories and all of that and were deeply influenced by them, right? The assumption that that makes the Chinese, I think, is already problematic, right? I mean, the Korean upper class was that way for most of its history, and they're Korean, right? They're not Chinese. The fact that you revere the Confucian classes doesn't make you Chinese. Um, so um, I think we can admit that they were deeply influenced by all of those traditions, and yet are not the same as the people of the North. And so when we're using a term like Chinese for all of them, what do we really mean, right? I mean, it's this very amorphous sort of cultural thing, which if we make it amorphous enough to include the North and the South, really needs to include Korea as well, mm -hmm. at which point we're calling the Koreans Chinese, which seems to be sort of offensive. Um, so once we problematize that, we realize the term Chinese is just not specific enough um, for this period to be useful. If you want to talk about people that Revere their ancestors or read Confucian classics or something, then you need another term. I use Semitic, which may seem like a circumlocution, but I think it's helpful in avoiding this from associating the relation of China or a Han Chinese ethnic group, right? Um, it's hard for us to dissociate those things in our mind. When you use the term Chinese, you think of China, right? And, uh, and, and what I'm trying to sort of get us away from that mindset. 
Um, so I try to find other language. Um, and over years, and you know, when I first started thinking through this stuff now, I said, probably you did like, what the hell do I call all of this stuff? Right? Like, it's so much easier to just call it North China and say, like, on the Yellow River Plains or whatever. But I feel like the benefit in terms of student understanding um, uh, is worth it. And they don't mind. They don't jump on those circumlocutions. It's like, oh, okay. Uh, so, um, so, so they're middle. Great. Well, I, I apologize to anybody online if we didn't quite get to your question, um, but thank you all for being here.